Well, thank you, Leanne. That was great. Asking a big question in our new sermon series that we'll be doing for the next several weeks. What is God doing? I want to take you to a story. It's a little longer of an intro than what I normally might give, but I believe you'll understand why I had to use the story of Lewis and Clark. In their expedition to explore the newly acquired Louisiana Purchase, they realized that it was built on false expectation. You see, they believed that like everyone before them, that the unexplored West was exactly the same geography as the familiar East. Well, this is the story of what they did when they discovered that they and everyone else before them were wrong. It's very instructing, challenging, and inspiring. Well, for over 300 years, explorers of at least four sovereign nations had been looking for a water route that would connect the Pacific Ocean to the Mississippi River. And everyone just knew it was out there somewhere. It was broadly believed, and there was a persistent assumption about the way that the world was just arranged. Well, President Thomas Jefferson in the U.S. had indeed commissioned these two, Lewis and Clark and their team, for just this moment declaring that they would find the cherished water route that everyone believed existed and it would ensure the nation's prosperity. Well, basically, whoever discovered and made claim to this water route would own the trade route and control the resources of the nation. It was basically like someone owning the internet. It was that big of a deal. <laughs> well, the discovery was deemed so vital to a national interest that actually Spain sent two different war parties to intercept Lewis and Clark and try to stop them. Well, what Lewis actually discovered was that 300 years of experts had all been completely and utterly wrong. In front of him, was not this gentle slope that had a navigable river to the Pacific Ocean, but what they ran into was this. Rocky Mountains, stretching out for miles and miles as far as they could see, one peak right after the, the other, like we see here west of us in Cochrane. There was no Northwest Passage they'd been told about, no navigable river, no water route. The, the driving assumption of the brightest, most adventurous, entrepreneurial, and creative leaders regarding this new world had been absolutely mistaken. It was assumed that the geography of the west, the west of the continental divide was the same geography east of it, and it was assumed that the land just rose gently over thousands of miles, and it would come to a peak, and then it would rescend gently to the Pacific Ocean. And in the same way they'd been able to take kill boats and canoes upriver, they'd be able to drift downriver right to the Pacific. But to be sure... These mountains that you see, well, a Native American people had told Lewis and Clark that the mountains ahead needed to be crossed. But when they thought of mountains, they, they pictured the rounded treetop bluffs of the Appalachians that they had known. Certainly no adventure into the western part of what we now know as the U.S. had seen anything, anything like these rocky mountains mountains. Meriwether Lewis realized that when he saw these mountains, everything changed. Basically, everything they'd accomplished up to that point was only a prelude, really, to what was going to be in front of them. They were literally going to go off the map into unchartered territory. 
They'd have to change plans, give up expectations, even reframe their entire mission. You see, what lay before them was nothing like what was behind them. There were no experts, no maps, no best practices, and no sure guides who could lead them safely and successfully. They knew that their adventure, the real discovery, was just beginning. I'm now going to take the metaphor for our present moment in history now. This is for your first notes in the message today. The world in front of us is radically different from everything behind us. Actually, the world that's in front of us right now is going to require all of us to think in new ways, have new skills. Uh, Perhaps it's really more evident in the world that I live in, the world as a pastor, the world of the church. You see, all that we have assumed about leading maybe Christian organizations or churches, all that we, in a sense, have been trained for in many ways, it's all in the past now. In a sense, we have left the map. In a sense, we're in uncharted territory, and it certainly is way different than what we expected. We're experience rafters you could say and we have to learn to be mountaineers what we know is true there's some things that we know that's true before covid uh, before covid hit what we know is that there were a high percentage of churches that actually were plateauing and declining Now, that wasn't happening in Bow Valley. We were seeing a pretty good amount of growth here. But evangelical churches as a whole were plateauing and declining. There was also an ever-increasing number of Canadians that were marking no religion on their census. Many writers were calling that time, and they're still calling this time, post-Christendom. Honestly, it's easy for us to act as if we still live in a Christian culture and that people's faith practices are the most important aspects of their lives. If we're not careful, we will long to come out of this COVID crisis and get back to normal. But we need to realize there really isn't and normal. And yes, we're going to come out of the COVID crisis, I believe, but what should we be prepared to do? Who should we be prepared to be? And what should we be about? Well, one thing I know for sure is this. I believe that God did give us at Bow Valley Baptist Church a very clear mission statement that we started actually presenting to the church not that long ago in 2020. And here's what it is. We exist to love like Jesus, live like Jesus, and change our world. I know for sure that we must be about that. And I know that I'm excited to consider uh, and figure out with our church staff, its leadership, and our entire church community what it will look like for us to be a church that pushes in, that presses into the idea of loving like Jesus, living like Jesus, and change our world. I think that's a dynamic mission statement. And we're going to dive into more teaching on that mission statement soon. But for now, in our new abnormal that we are all experiencing together, those of you watching this online service in your pajamas or whatever the case is, this new abnormal that we know, I want to ask, what is God doing? What is he doing as he's leading us off the maps that we know into new uncharted territory? Well, there, there is good news, 
in this territory that we're entering into. We have a compass. And that compass, it's the word of God, the Bible. And another compass is the Lord Jesus himself. And I believe that God has led me to a beautiful passage of scripture that is from the Old Testament, which is going to serve as our road map as we go off the map, so to speak. And that passage is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I do believe that 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 is perfect for us in this time as we consider what God is doing. Now, to be clear, the words we're going to read are God's word spoken to a man named Solomon. He was the king of Israel at the time. And likewise, the word land that we will see in this passage referred to the land of Israel. Well, let me begin actually in verse 12, and then I'll show you verse 14 on your PowerPoint. God's word tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. Verse 13, If I shut the sky so there's no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people. And then verse 14, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. One might ask, (laughs) is it appropriate to apply an Old Testament passage like this one to our current day? And you might ask, Pastor, are you saying that this COVID is a pestilence from God like the grasshoppers you just read about? Good question. I do want to be clear with you that I'm not saying that God sent the coronavirus. <laughs> he allowed it for sure, but I do not believe it is a God sent plague. But, but I do believe he can use the virus or anything like it so, so we will pay much closer attention to a verse like the one we just read. Certainly, certainly, the New Testament teaches us to pay attention to the Old Testament and its teachings. You see, the Bible, our compass, tells us this in the book of 2 Timothy. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Now, you see that word scripture there in that passage? In this text, it refers to Old Testament scripture. That would include our 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 passage. I believe it's very appropriate for any Christian to obey the spirit of the text we've looked at by... In, endeavoring to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek God's face, to turn from our wicked ways, trusting that God will hear, forgive, and restore. Today, followers of Jesus, we are God's people, as that passage discussed. Christians are those who are called by his name. Therefore, it's very appropriate that we apply the timeless truths of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, as God's people. Well, the Apostle Peter, speaking to a group of first century Christians, said this, Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Well, how suitable for 
all of God's people today, followers of Jesus, to humble ourselves, pray and seek the Lord's face and turn from our wicked ways, asking him to graciously hear from heaven, forgive our sin and bring spiritual restoration to our land. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, there are three precepts there or inspired points that are consistently called for by God throughout Scripture. Their humility, hunger, and holiness. This is your, for your note here. Note this. The first requirement for knowing what God is doing is humility. You see our passage? Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. To know what God is doing, you have to walk humbly with God. Who was the humblest person who ever lived? The Bible says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Of course, this passage is referring to the Lord Jesus himself. You see, humility, following in the footsteps of Jesus himself and being humble is key to knowing what God is doing. Well, the second requirement, this is for your notes as well, for knowing what God is doing is hunger. We see that in our 2 Chronicles 7, 14 passage. Do you see it? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. You see, Jesus urged his followers to hunger and thirst for righteousness. All followers of Jesus would do well to increase our hunger for righteousness and godliness and to learn to pray and seek God's face. Now, if you did not hear our previous series on prayer, or maybe you would like to think more about prayer, you should go back and look at it. I just taught through the Lord's Prayer. And you can learn a lot about prayer from the scriptures that in the Lord Jesus teaching on prayer. We need to hunger for God. We need to seek his face. Now the final requirement for knowing what God is doing is holiness. Look at our passage. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You see, holiness comes by means of repenting from sin. Repentance means that we confess our sin and turn away from them. That leads us to true holiness. Well, these three emphasis from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, humility, hunger, and holiness are much needed. They are desperately needed by you and by me. You know, there are some Christians now in Canada They are praying for a fresh spiritual awakening and a revival among those of us that know Jesus Christ. And I, for one, am praying that we will embrace genuine humility, a genuine hunger, a genuine holiness, so that we will know and that we will begin to understand what God is doing and what he wants to do. I think it's maybe something different than we may have ever known before and experienced in his church. And I am also praying that the Lord will graciously see fit to hear from heaven and forgive our sin and send us much needed 
restoration. Well, in light of this, I do not know of a verse in the Bible that serves as a better roadmap and guide for us into knowing what God is doing than 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It starts off like this. Then, if my people. You see, God wants to do something new and special with his people. A reorientation of sorts. And he has allowed something to happen. He's allowed this COVID to get our attention. And we would be amiss if we thought that COVID was just some interruption messing with our summer. (laughs) Or if, if we thought it's just something awful that's very inconvenient. (laughs) No, no, no. It it is much more than that. And God is now at work in the midst of this crisis. How do I know that? Well, the Bible tells us, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good uh, of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Has God caused this virus? I, I don't think so. Has he allowed it? Yes, absolutely. And so hear me out. I am thankful for God's hope in this time. I am. But I believe we need and are desperate to hear that there is more than just hope through this and after this time. I mean, I am thankful for the mercy of God and for him sparing the lives of many and so far keeping COVID to a less degree in Alberta than many thought. But we need more than just mercy in this time. I am thankful for how many of you are loving your neighbors through this and how you're going to continue to do that. I'm so grateful for that. I'm trying to do that. And the Bible is clear that we're to love our neighbor. But I don't know about you, but I just can't know about and live that out and just be satisfied with that in this time. I long to know what God is doing in this time. How about you? You see, I believe he has a great purpose in it. And I believe God has brought us to this time in some ways, in many ways, if not most ways, so that we will actually kind of be like Lewis and Clark. And we're looking at those terrifying mountains, realizing that what is in front of us is not the same as what we knew before. Now, has God done anything like this with his people in the past? A radical reorientation. Yes, he has. Think about Job. If you don't know his story, you should look it up in the Old Testament and read that story. I'm in the book of Job in my quiet time right now with God. He had a radical reorientation take place through something that was very terrible. You think about Jonah. What a radical reorientation he had. You think about Noah. What a radical reorientation he had. And think about the first disciples becoming fishers of men rather than of fish. That was a radical reorientation for them. (laughs) Can I say that phrase one more time? A radical reorientation. It is taking place. The world has just experienced a cosmic shift. If we miss God changing us radically in this time, we have missed one of the greatest purposes of this time. God longs to change you, to reshape you, to redefine you, and to focus us on him and his purposes and the mission he gave to us. 
No pastor has ever led Bow Valley or any other congregation for that matter in a time like this. Not in our generation, have they? <laughs> Nothing like this has ever happened in our lifetimes. The world in front of us is nothing like the world behind us. How exciting is that? And how challenging is that? Well, we will tackle these tough challenges and we can even prevail in and through this time. But we must follow. We must listen to, we must recognize the call of our God in this time. And it's not a call, a call for things to become normal, but a call to seek God, to seek him. In a moment, I'm going to pray with you. And I want you to pray with me. I'm going to pray two different prayers with you as you're watching this. And I'm going to, I want you to engage in these prayers with me. I'm going to pray short sections and I'd like you to repeat them after me. The first group that I'm talking to this morning are those of you that may not know if you're in a personal relationship with God or not. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer for you to pray with me. And then listen, those of you that already know God personally, you say, I am God's people, as this passage is talking about, you know Christ personally already, then I'm going to pray with you. But first of all, for those of you that would say, I don't know if I know God personally, I want to invite you to pray with me first. Would you do that? Dear God, I have heard this message. I realize there's things in front of me that are much different than things behind me. God, you have my attention. And so God, I realize that I need to know you. And I realize that you've given the Lord Jesus. He humbled himself. And so now I humble myself. I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn from them and turn to you. So God, forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died to pay for my sins. And God, thank you for loving me, for giving your son to die for me, to pay for my sins. And God, I believe that Jesus Christ, he is Lord. I want him to be the Lord, the leader of my life. I ask him to do that now. God, I also believe that Jesus Christ, he rose from the dead, just as the Easter story has said. I believe it. I thank you, God. I thank you that I can humble myself before you and ask you to lead my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you pray that prayer with me, would you text the number that you see in the screen there, 587-577-7869? Would you let me know about that? And I'm going to lead now this group of God followers, those that know God personally in a prayer. And I would invite you, actually, if you have space, we are going to go before a holy God in a time of deep sincerity here. And so I would invite you, if you can quiet the things around you, even if you need to pause the video for a moment so that if there's kids in the room or whatever the case is, so that you can sincerely take part in this with me right now. And kids, you can pray this with me too, but let's just be quiet so we can focus on this for just a moment. So let's pray. Dear God in heaven, your word says 
that I am one of your people because I know Christ personally. So this message, this message today, God, from the Old Testament is you speaking to me. God, you have invited me today to humble myself. And God, I confess I have so much pride. God, forgive me for my pride. God, you've invited me to seek your face. And God, I'm hungry. I'm hungry, God, to know you above my complaining about this time, above all the challenges I'm facing. I'm hungry, God, to know you. So I, God, will seek your face. And I will pray. And God, your word has asked me to turn to turn from my wicked ways. Oh God, show me my wicked ways. Please God, please God, show me. I want to live in holiness before you. Oh God, please. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to hear from you. Would you text me what God has been doing in your heart in these prayer times? If you prayed that second prayer with me sincerely, I'd love for you to text this number and let me know about it. I want to be able to pray with you about what you have prayed about today. So please let me know. I look forward to hearing from you. And here's what we're going to press in. If you stay with us through this series, we are going to go after this question. God, what are you doing? And in this time, we are going to find God and his heart and what he desires to speak to each one of us. And it will be such a sweet time. And I can't wait to go into this with you. Thank you.